If you've been listening to the podcast recently, chances are you've noticed that we've had a lot of back-to-school information. The reason being, it's back-to-school time. And on today's show, I thought it would be especially interesting to bring on a school nurse to really go over all that school nurses really do. We'll niche down into food allergy, but we also start at more of a 40,000-foot view of why school nurses are so critical to allowing all children to have safe education experiences. So on the episode today is one of my favorite school nurses, Tracy White. She is the specialist with the Office of Student Services in the Virginia Department of Education. She is one of the leaders in school nursing in this country. And I am so excited to have her on the show and really just dive in to all the amazingness that school nurses bring to our schools, bring to our children. So here's the intro and then my interview with Tracy White. Welcome to Food Allergy and Your Kiddo with Dr. Alice Hoyt, the podcast about demystifying food allergies, diminishing allergy anxiety, and taking back control. Let's navigate this challenge together with evidence-based information, scientific research, and tried and proven practices. And now, here's your host, board-certified allergist and immunologist specializing in food allergy, Dr. Alice Hoyt. Tracy, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm glad to be here. So we'll dive right in. Can you share with our listeners sort of how did your journey with school nursing begin? Well, um, it began quite by accident. Um, I was a critical care nurse in a busy teaching hospital and uh, newly married. And um, my husband was transferred um, uh, numerous times in a, a very short time frame. And so it brought me to um, different parts of the state of Virginia and North Carolina and um, away from these larger medical centers. And I began to gravitate more toward the community health setting. Um, I actually volunteered in my children's school, which is right down the street, and uh, because they did not have a full-time school nurse. And um, that's when... Uh, that it was long before FERPA um, uh, came along. But yeah, um, it just they were anxious to have people, um, nursing staff um, that were available to help manage uh, kids in the school setting. So I did that one or two days a week. Wow. And uh, yeah, about how long ago would you say that was? Um, I began um, in 1993. Uh, so I've been in school health for a long time now. I've uh, been a nurse for 44 years and um, doesn't seem possible, but I've uh, seen a lot, of, a lot of changes and um, never would have believed uh, that I would be working with a pediatric population in a community-based setting. I surprised myself. Because <laughs> you were critical care before, so you're okay. kind of the opposite of Um, what you thought you would be doing. Yeah. Yeah. I was pretty, um, you know, I can remember, I just, I worked uh, at VCU in Richmond and uh, was able to scrub and all those, you know, they're really concrete kinds of um, functions and was on a flight, uh, flight crew as well. And so it went, it did a complete 180 um, and, and I think especially having children and that changed, um, my, um, what I thought about, um, how to care for kids and, and where my kids were going and what kind of care were they going to be receiving. And so that had an impact on me too. But I will tell you that if my nursing instructors could, could see me now, they, they're probably all dead, but they, they would be rolling in the grave because pediatrics was probably one of my least favorite Um, areas of practice when I was in nursing school. Wow. I never would have thought that about you. I mean, we've known each other for a few years now and um, just your passion for making sure that these kids receive the the best possible care at school. um, I'm, I, wow, 
That's so interesting to know that. <laughs> and yeah. um, tell tell our listeners um, sort of what sort of a 40,000 foot view will niche down to food allergy in a little bit, but what school nurses, what, what does a school nurse, you hear my, my daughter speaking of having children, what does a school nurse do? Well, right off the bat, I want to dispel um, the fact that it's all about just band-aids and ice. I get really irritated with that because school nurses just embrace so much more than that. And I think people that assume that just are just not aware of what the nurses do on an everyday basis. And I have uh, nurse friends who um, look at me and say, why did you want to be a school nurse? They think about it as something that you would bring a book to do. You bring a book into the office during the day that is going to be very boring. And, and they are just stunned and surprised that school nurses are busy doing actually many more skill-based procedures than they themselves often do in a hospital or a clinic setting. And so um, school nurses have to have a broad um, understanding of disease, communicable disease. Um, We have to know how to be able to take care of uh, not only the acute care needs, the kids that do get hurt on the playground or gym class, those, those kinds of things, or that become ill while they're at school, but to address the complex um, health care needs um, related to uh, chronic um, illness or um, children that are medically fragile. And so in, since I started um, in, in nursing, um, we, we, with the advances of technology and, and research, the kids that would never have survived um, um, early delivery um, or, or a NICU, a neonatal intensive care experience after birth are, are surviving and they're thriving. They may have um, a developmental disability or something related to um, a preterm or a complex um, a medical issue, but we are the ones, school nurses, working with these children and their families each and every day in the school setting. Um, now with COVID, um, that has created a- additional um, things to think about, um, separating kids that are sick and training teachers and um, assessment skills and all kinds of things like that, that we've had to consider as a result of returning to school um, in those areas where the community transmission, you know, allows us to do so. So um, it, <laughs> we, we actually um, have a huge, um, in the state of Virginia, uh, my good friend Vicki Southall, the University of Virginia, um, is a a very, um, she writes a lot of um, mean articles and does a lot of research and she has created a school-based health procedures manual, which we use and it's over 700 pages. So it, it addresses just about every medical need and procedure, um, what, what the norm should be and what expected complications are. And so um, that, that, that represents how many things, how many different scenarios we have in a school setting. And some kids may have multiple um, health-related issues that school nurses have to care for each and every day in the school setting. So again, it's not just um, boo-boos and ice um, and sending kids home. It's um, what I love is the ability to work with our families, work with our our teaching staff um, and school staff to really work and build those relationships with the families within our school community. Um, So the thing about what I like most about school nursing is it combines your skills and your communication and the role of a a nurse educator all kind of rolled up in one. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that in the United States, all children are entitled to an education, and that includes children who have complex medical conditions. So if it wasn't for school nurses, there would be no way to provide that education 
to all of these children who, to your point, are now able to, to live um, that, that, you know, 20, 30 years ago um, wouldn't necessarily survive, but now these kids can, but they do need extra help especially extra help at school. And it's because of school nurses that those children are able to have an education and not just those children are able to have an education, but also those parents are able to work some outside of the home. Um, and, um, and in, in the case of a woman who maybe was working before she had a child and then felt, you know, once the kiddo was back to school, then felt called to, to work outside the home. Um, she's able to do that or the flip side, the dad's able to do that because there is a school nurse there helping to take care of that child when, when that child is not with the parents. So, I mean, just school nurses play such a tremendous role. And and I think a lot of people maybe don't necessarily recognize that unless they themselves have a child who is in that situation. Sure. And it's it's not in, in Virginia, um, as with many other states, it is not a mandate for schools to employ school nurses. Um, not every person that you see in a school health office is a registered nurse. Um, they may have personnel in there, but they may be trained unlicensed people or a, an LPN um, would be serving in that capacity. And sometimes um, in our in our more rural settings, it could be the school secretary. You know, some things don't change. Um, that was when when I was in school was go to the school secretary if you if you were hurt. Um, but you know, I just want to drive that home that um, you know that we really we really uh, emphasize the need for a registered nurse um, to be in schools all day every day. Um, to really benefit our children um, and maximize their learning potential. And, and some other things, too, that um, nurses lend to the educational you know, community. We're, a, we're the one medical person in an educational setting. And so um, we really, that communication with our administrators, um, but we can be very useful um, in tracking um, identifying trends and communicable diseases like COVID or um, or looking at the absentee rate um, of kids in school and, and calling parents up and, you know, what's, what's the deal? What's going on? How can we help? What resources do you need um, for that as, as asthmatic who, um, I mean, I live in a rural area and, and um, lots of people heat with wood and, and, you know, that's, that's terrible for an asthmatic with all the dust and things like that. So, you know, working to get resources for those kids um, and families, you know, such as fuel oil delivered or, um, you know, just you're kind of like a lot of things rolled up in one. I think if you're a good school nurse, I think that's, I guess that's um, just really biased with that. But I think you're a little bit, you're, you're all nurse, you're part teacher, you're, um, a little bit of a social worker in some cases, um, a counselor in some cases, and I don't want to, uh, we're not counselors, I just want to clarify that, but we do really address the needs of the whole child because the goal is for all children to achieve success um, in school, and, and that's going to look different for every child. That's exactly right, and uh, before we started recording, you told me a story about a little girl um, who had some special medical needs that y'all were able to teach a skill. Could yeah. you share that story? Sure. Um, we have, again, as I mentioned, there are kids, um, you know, prior to, um, you know, the 1975, uh, I believe, kids were separated, kids that needed special um, that were special education or had special health needs were kind of segregated from the, um, the, the regular typical school community. But um, we had a little girl um, who had just turned six with spina bifida and um, her mom. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more, our listeners, a little bit more about spina bifida and some of yes. the challenges they have? Yes. Um, so um, this young lady um, 
was um, spina bifida affects, you know, the nerves and the nerves um, affect the muscles. And so she had no, she had no feeling from the waist down. Um, and she was, um, she spent her school day in a, in a wheelchair and um, she could not, um, she did not know when her bladder was full or her bowels uh, were full. And so she would wear a brief and, you know, it's really important how it is when you have to go to the bathroom, how your bladder expands. And so we want to, um, you know, kind of emulate um, several times over the course of the school day that she would have to empty her bladder. And so we were able to work with her from kindergarten um, and we would initially do straight casts um, in the school clinic. And um, she, was, she was pretty astute. And mom, mom was um, a little resistant to, um, to teaching her at home um, how to do this. She just felt like she couldn't do it. And we were able to connect with mom and, and just you know, support her and have her support us in our efforts. And that child could self cast by the time she was six years old. Um, she would come to the school clinic and after a while she was like routine. She just rolled by me and uh, she would go into the clinic bathroom. She would get her supplies and she would take care of business and um, check in with me every day, a couple times a day. And it was a great accomplishment. Um, that and this is this is part of the teaching the health education aspect of school nursing that I love um, is helping kids um, just achieve their potential. And school is not just about learning uh, reading and math. It's you know preparing our kids for um, adulthood and those skills that they're going to need. And I I wonder sometimes about that little girl who is. Now in her 30s, um, what, how long it would have taken her to, um, to uh, reach that level of skill to be able to self-care for herself. And that in itself, um, when you rely on people to know that you can do it yourself is, is a, a great personal achievement. That's such a wonderful story. I mean, it's it's a practical skill for her, but just the dignity that that little girl was then able to have as she started making that journey of mm-hmm. of more so taking care of herself and at the age of 6. Yep. And and because of you and and school nurses who were able to to teach her. And I mean, I just I love that story because it really highlights to your point earlier, that it's so much more than ice packs and band-aids. Absolutely. Amen. <laughs> so let's let's niche down to food allergy um, and and talk a little bit more about food allergy and, and kind of start with how do you feel the landscape of food allergy? Um, and you can also talk some about food intolerance here. Sure. How is how has that changed in your career as a nurse? Well, when I started practicing in the 1990s, um, I, there were children or students that had um, uh, EpiPens um, there, mainly for peanut allergies. Um, but we had a number, and many schools continued to use, they have an ice cream day. And um, as my years as a school nurse in an elementary school setting passed, I noticed that more and more kids were coming in to take um, their enzymes before ingesting um, their, their treat, their ice cream treats for the week. And um, so many parents refer to that as a food allergy. They have a food allergy to milk. And really what that is, is more of an intolerance because food allergies and food intolerance um, uh, can often be, um, they're two very different things. So the food intolerance tends to be more of a gastrointestinal or digestive issues related to those milk proteins, for example, or soy. Um, Kids have diarrhea or upset stomach, um, sometimes some nausea in cases, but mainly lower track um, digestive issues. and that's what I began seeing, um, that 
those kids having and coming into the clinic for that. Um, but before we even talk about um, the, the landscape of food allergy, let's just look at food in general, how that has changed in the last 30, 30 or more years. Um, it used to be you'd walk in a cafeteria and everything was homemade um, from the rolls to the hamburgers. I mean, they were, there was nothing prepackaged. Those cafeteria ladies um, did a wonderful job and uh, slathering big pieces of cake and cookies and all kinds of things that were most of them made from scratch. Um, today, we are working with fewer staff in the cafeterias in our buildings. We have more prepackaged food um, that's available for purchase at the school, everything from you know your chicken nuggets to your pizzas and things like that. And plus students that are coming from home with a packed lunch um, very often um, have those you know lunchable products and things like that, the little ready-made snack packs and um, that they bring to school. And, and a lot that's within those packets are, you know, have some food additives to it. So um, we went from a time where my greatest concern was about serving size <laughs> and obesity, which is still a concern, um, to um, those kids that are having more sensitivities to what they're eating. And it seemed like as the 90s progressed, the number of kids that um, would come in at the beginning of the school year um, with, with notes from their specialists, with EpiPens, that, um, citing stories about a response they had during the summer has increased dra dramatically. And so what we've had to do from the school perspective is really um, increase awareness of um, food allergies, um, sensitivities, um, ensuring that every, you know as many people from as many areas of the school are trained in recognizing the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. So that just doesn't mean a classroom teacher or a school nurse. That means the cafeteria workers, that means monitors, that means the school bus drivers as well. So the school nurse has had to really expand um, the training um, of, of uh, increasing awareness and how to respond to um, food allergies. Um, and and uh, at the time, this is in the 90s again, um, I'm really thinking old here, but we, we didn't have um, stock epinephrine in our school. In fact, we didn't have stock epinephrine in Virginia schools um, until 2015, um, and that may be 14. Uh, but um, when we had a, a really tragic incident in Virginia, um, in our Virginia schools, and our legislators um, really lobbied um, for for stock epinephrine um, for all schools, all public and private schools. So um, we've seen, and it's because there has been an increased awareness personally, um, you know, within our communities um, and um, because of public pressure um, on school safety. So, you know, more kids, more training, um, we've really had to be on top of uh, those um, increasing awareness, um, and um, as well as our nurses, our unlicensed staff as well. So um, the landscape of food and the response to food allergies has changed pretty dramatically in the last several, in the last uh, immediately in Virginia in the last five years with the addition of stock epinephrine, but um, I've been able to see it from um, a more global aspect evolve into a much better situation now for keeping our kids safe at school. You bring up so many interesting points um, from how the landscape of food itself has changed to seeing more kids with food intolerance like lactose intolerance mm -hmm. where they need to take that that lactase enzyme to help mm -hmm. them break down the milk sugar and now into more 
food allergy, meaning they'll eat the food and have an immediate immune response that includes hives, swelling, trouble breathing. My listeners know that they can go to foodallergyandyourkiddo.com. That's the info blog that accompanies this podcast. Um, or if you're, you're new to listening, then you might not know, but you could go to that, um, to the podcast or to the, um, to the website and you can read about the difference between intolerance and food allergy. And when we get into food allergy, although food intolerance, it's so important to know if you're intolerant of a food, if you have lactose mm-hmm. intolerance, you can avoid it because those symptoms can be sure. tremendously uncomfortable. They can be um, socially very frustrating. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when we get into food allergy and thinking about, to your point about, you know, the tragic story that, that or the tragic tragic event that occurred, um, and in the tragic events that we hear, where a child accidentally ingests something to which they're allergic and they die. I mean, it's it's one of the reasons I think we have so much challenge when it comes to food allergy and providing good education is because it's just so mind boggling that something like that can actually happen. It's just it's horrific. Um, But what's really reassuring, um, especially to me as an allergist, is that there are people like you, Tracy, who are in leadership positions who are advocating for best practices to keep kids as safe as possible at school. And that brings us into stock epinephrine. Mm -hmm. And what listeners might not know is that stock epinephrine is an epinephrine auto-injector epinephrine being the treatment for a severe allergic reaction. So it's an epinephrine auto-injector that a doctor actually prescribes to the school. That way, if somebody has an allergic reaction at school and they don't have their own epinephrine auto-injector, they might be one of the kiddos who has their first allergic reaction at school. So, So they were never prescribed one because they didn't know they had a food allergy until they had that reaction. That stock epinephrine is there for those situations um, so that that life-threatening reaction can be treated and can be treated promptly. And also to your point, it's, it's the school nurses who are so often the only medical person in the school, if not just one school, and responsible for many schools. And so not only is the school nurse the one who most likely is is the one everybody wants to use the epinephrine, um, but it's the school nurse who is who is teaching people how to recognize an allergic reaction and how to treat it, which is why I love working with you guys with with uh, the Code Anna program with the nonprofit, so that we can not just not just teach students and not just um, provide you guys with resources, but provide you guys with resources that then you can use to teach others about how to recognize and respond to anaphylaxis. Absolutely. Um, You know, the fact you brought up a good point, you know, there are many nurses that have multiple schools and do have to train those people um, in a school setting and, um, especially whether we're in COVID or now, I mean, I don't think you can have enough people trained within a school to respond um, to to an emergency period and that they, um, in Virginia, we do have um, legislation um, that that indicates the number of people based on the size of the school that have to be trained in a variety of different capacities um, to, to keep our kids safe at school. Um, but I, I think too, it's um, the the stock of epinephrine. Well, as as school nurses, we we tend to know um, generally the kids that are returning to school that have had you know that have had uh, ep- epipens or auto injectors or AVEQ devices. Um, they bring them to school along with the parent permission, the physician authorization, and we have them. Um, the stock epinephrine that we have um, is used for those unknown cases. And those are what scare me um, worse. I mean, it could be used on a visitor. It could be used on a staff member because, you know, anyone can have a life-threatening allergy at any point. So the fact that we know that there's a certain population of kids with um, 
with this uh, that have uh, medication at schools is comforting. Um, having an auto injector and a uh, stock epinephrine um, within our schools helps us to address those unknown conditions that can occur at any time that are life-threatening um, to anyone within the school. Um, that's what's comforting to me, that we finally have that in place. Absolutely. And you guys do so much to keep kids safe at school. You as the Virginia school nurses. Um, but I, I also want to ask you guys, ask you what what can parents of children with food allergies do? How can they work with their local school nurse, with their local schools to help create that safe learning environment? Well, I tell you what, um, I think the, the most important thing is for parents to reach out to the school, not only the school nurse, but the teacher, maybe the administrator, loop them in. Communication is huge. And um, by, you know, and I think everybody needs to be on the same page. And so providing um, our schools with that emergency um, uh, treatment plan, plan of care, and the medications for the start of school, um, helping um, your own child recognize um, those um, signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, helping them to read labels um, so that they can, it empowers them that they can um, look and really know what they can and can't have to eat. But knowing too that that relationship you are building um, from the school, whatever grade level it is, will follow, um, will hopefully follow that student until they complete their education um, in school. So, um, you know, we as a school have, you know, our, we're tasked with certain things, but we want to be able to work with um, our families, um, our staff, um, and provide a student-centered care specific for that child um, so that they can, um, again, um, uh, be academically successful in school. We really don't want our kids to be out of school because of an incident that happened um, and miss that not only the educational time, but the social time too with, with their friends. And as a person that's had overwhelming anaphylaxis, um, it scares the living daylights out of you when you have that. Um, as an adult, to be able to put your finger on it, uh, I can't imagine um, young children, um, um, you know, being able to identify those things. And I can totally understand why parents can be very uncomfortable and anxious about sending their child to school. So again, that's where the conversation and relationship building um, needs to be. Um, and I want to also encourage, um, um, I had a situation this morning where we had an unusual um, a case that we hadn't dealt, a particular school division hadn't dealt with. And I said, look, you know, allergists often have nurse educators or people in their office that are willing to work with schools. Bring them in, bring them to the table. Um, with Zoom now, we can have this discussion. Nobody has to leave their home. We can really address some of these concerns. So it's the teacher, it's the physician or healthcare provider, it's the school and the family. We're all focused on that student together, collaboratively working. And I think that's that's a win-win situation for everybody. I love it. I love that. Um, a few years ago, we did a program at University of Virginia when I was there that that really focused on getting getting everybody to the table. And now, to your point with you know, one of the um, silver linings to COVID is that it's much more normal to have these Zoom meetings and you are in your house and, you know, you are holding your daughter in your lap and, and um, just things are still getting done. And in a way it's, it's in some cases it, it can make things get done with a lot less friction um, because you're able to just, let's have a Zoom meeting with, with the doctor real quick. Um, cause yes, a lot of doctors are, they, they want the school to have the good information. They want the parents to have the good information, but even with all these 
all these different technologies we have, sometimes it's just, there's, there's some roadblocks there. And so now, um, I'm especially hopeful that by more people doing these, um, you know, whether it's FaceTime, Zoom, whatever it is, but there's a way to just quickly get on, have a quick conversation with all parties and make sure that everybody's on the same page for how to best take care of that kiddo and make sure that everybody knows how to recognize symptoms, how to respond during an allergy emergency, and, and really arguably most importantly, how can we prevent that child from getting in that situation to start with? And I mean, you guys, um, I, I've worked with, I would say the Virginia school nurses probably the most um, because that's that's really where I started the Code Anna program. And um, if you listen to one of the earlier podcasts that, that was a session that I just had with you guys, um, I just, I, I love working with y'all because you're such a passionate group. You just <laughs> want to take such good care of these kids. And I think that on today's podcast episode, I think you really gave a great picture of what school nurses do. It's kind of like what, what one parent may see is just the tip of the iceberg um, compared to maybe what another parent sees depending on the medical complexity. But you guys are always trying to give each child the best possible medical care at school so that they can learn. And it's just, it's so wonderful to know that, there are school nurses who, who are working so hard to keep our kids safe. Um, you guys are awesome. You know, I love y'all. Um, (laughs) (laughs) thank you. Thank you. As we close out, is, is there anything else that you want to share with our audience, um, to food allergy mamas who, who are listening or to, um, any school nurses who may be listening, anything else that, that is just on your heart you want to share? Well, again, I, I just think that um, that relationship um, that exists or doesn't exist between a parent and a school um, is hugely important. If it doesn't exist, um, it really behooves parents um, and, and schools to work together. Um, I found that in my many years in, in healthcare that, you know, that relationship is going to be key for your child throughout their school, um, their school experience. And so um, we, we all make mistakes. We all make errors, but if you make errors, but it's not errors in, in healthcare, but, you know, if, if a child wasn't sent home when a parent feels like they should have been sent home due to a fever or, or whatever, that those misunderstandings, um, when you have a good relationship, um, you know, really do help all the way around. So those, those keys to communicating, um, I am really hopeful as school, as our children are returning to school, we've had some schools that have been in session for three weeks now. Um, using a hybrid model, and our school nurses are in touch with the kids that are at home, um, just checking in on them, uh, just seeing how they're doing, um, establishing, keeping those relationships up. And I do think that that cannot be um, understated. So build those relationships with your school. Uh, I realize not all school nurses, not all administrators, and not all parents are the same and, and have the same concerns, but please. Um, you know, reach out to them and see how you can help them uh, better care for your child in school. Very well said. Tracy, thank you so much for sharing all of this with our listeners today. Come back to the podcast soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Isn't she amazing? And Don't we all just have a much deeper appreciation for school nurses than probably before that interview? Sometimes when we think of school nurses, we are thinking of Band-Aids and ice packs or health forms or vaccine records, but we may not see their interactions with other children who have 
these medical challenges who are incredibly complex regarding the medical issues that not only interfere with them receiving an education, but that interfere with them just having as normal as possible of a lifestyle. And so we're blessed to have school nurses in our schools so that all children, regardless of medical conditions, can receive a solid education. So I hope y'all enjoyed this episode. Also, I talked about Code Anna. Go to our show notes. Go to the podcast website, foodallergyandyourkiddo.com, where you can find information about Code Anna, and you can learn how your school can be better equipped for medical emergencies. Okay, y'all. It's still hurricane season. We're dealing with these hurricanes. So of course, stay safe out there. And remember, I'm an allergist, but I'm not your allergist. So talk with your allergist about all you've learned on today's episode. And of course, God bless you and God bless your family. Thanks for listening to this episode of Food Allergy and Your Kiddo with food allergist, Dr. Alice Hoyt. For more information on navigating the world of food allergy, visit www.foodallergyandyourkiddo.com and follow Dr. Hoyt on Twitter at Dr. Alice Hoyt. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review. Let's take the anxiety and confusion out of food allergy.